Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And today's topic is one that has been on my list for quite a while, but I hadn't thought about him for a bit until I was watching the movie Tar and his name came up. That's another thing related to my travels. That was on a flight. I was like, you watching this on an airplane? <laughs> yes. Um, it comes up in passing very early on in the film. So outside of music circles, Jean-Baptiste Lully is perhaps best known for the unusual circumstances of his death, but he lived a really fascinating life that would rival just about any fictional rags to riches story. The Chateau de Versailles website has a little anecdotal sidebar about him that reads, Despite his Italian origins, Lully was the most ardent defender of French music and the founder of the French operatic tradition. So today we're going to talk about how an Italian kid landed in France and became so deeply ingrained in both the royal court and the country's cultural history. So Giovanni Battista Lully was born November 29th, 1632 in Florence, Italy. We don't really know a whole lot about his childhood, although he later claimed that a Franciscan monk had taught him a little bit of guitar. He also later claimed that his parents had been part of Florence's noble class, but it really appears that his father, Lorenzo de Maldo Lully, was actually a miller. His mother was Caterina del Serra, and she was also from a Miller's family. Giovanni had an older brother and sister who died when he was still very young, and he was his parents' only surviving child. When Giovanni was just 11, he was spotted performing allegedly during carnival festivities by the Duke de Guise, or possibly a member of the Duke's family. Giovanni's mother had died around this same time, and so it appears that when the offer was made for the Duc de Guise to take the young boy away to France, it was not met with resistance. So soon, Giovanni was going by the French version of his name, Jean-Baptiste Lully, and he did legally take that name, but he did that when he became a naturalized French citizen, which did not happen for almost two decades after this. The first job that young Lully had in France was serving as garçon de chambre and conversational companion to the young Mademoiselle de Montpensier. This was Anne-Marie-Louise d'Orléans, Duchess of Montpensier, who was 14 at the time that young Lully appeared in France. She had in him a native Italian speaker that she could practice learning that language with. He was paid 150 livres a year for this position, But this also meant that Lully had access to educational opportunities of his own. He was exposed to a lot of different music of all kinds, which he really loved. He started learning music more formally with a string ensemble who played for the young royal. There are two different versions of how Lully's time in the Montpensier household ended. One is that he showed a lot of promise musically, but was abruptly let go from his position when he wrote some verses set to music that were very scandalous and full of innuendo. The other version is much less salacious, at least for Lully. When the series of French civil wars that came to collectively be known as La Fronde took place over the years of 1648 to 1653, Mademoiselle de Montpensier was caught up in it. At this point, Louis XIV had not yet fully assumed the throne. His mother, Anne of Austria, and Jules Cardinal Mazarin, her Italian chief minister, were running things. That did not sit well with the French nobility or the Parlement. Initially, Mademoiselle de Montpensier's involvement in La Fronde seemed kind of minimal. She became friends with participants in the Fronde des Nobles. That was the segment of the conflict that involved the nobility opposing a reduction in their influence and power. But then she kind of got right in the middle of it when she tried to intercede with the city of Orléans attempting to stay neutral in all of this, and things kind of spiraled from there, and she did become much more involved. She was ultimately exiled for her part in the conflict, and in this version of Jean-Baptiste Lully no longer working for her, he simply asked to be let go because he did not want to live in the country. Of course, the relationship that most influenced the course of Lully's life was the one that he had with the king, Louis XIV. 
The two men appeared on stage together on February 23rd, 1653 in the Ballet Royal de la Nuit. In our two-part episode on the history of ballet, which came out in 2019, we talked about how Louis XIV had formalized ballet, shifting it from being a social activity to a performative art. And Lully was instrumental in that, although his real power as a leader in the arts came later. But Lully and the king really hit it off from the start. Louis' appointments to various creative roles in the arts at the king's command began not long after they met. In the summer of 1653, Lully became head of Louis XIV's personal orchestra, nicknamed Petit Violon du Roi, the Little Violins. This was the first step in a historic rise to fame and power. For context, Lully was six years older than the king, and Louis XIV was still a teenager at this time. He was 14 or 15, so right at the age when having a witty friend in his 20s would probably seem really alluring. From early on, Louis XIV had in Lully a friend who would devote himself to keeping the monarch entertained and amused and delighted, Lully, of course, benefited from the favor bestowed on him by one of the most powerful men in Europe. And really, of the world, although that felt weird to type, so I typed it and deleted it many times. Uh, In his role as the king's composer, Lully started writing music for court ballets, and he also performed in them. And he quickly made a name for himself as a dancer and composer, but also because of his fantastic comedic performances, so he was also considered a comedian. He gained the nickname Baptiste as his stage name and became something of a celebrity. He's Baptiste is mentioned in a lot of writing of the day uh, as being this amazing performer, and it was Lully. During this time, Lully had developed the little violins into a group so exceptional that it was soon seen as far superior to the royal orchestra that it was technically an offshoot of. But eventually, the two of them did merge for court ballets. Starting in 1661, Jean-Baptiste Lully went through a particularly important stretch lasting a couple of years. This was the year he became a French citizen and took his French version of his name legally. He became superintendent of music and court composer to the king on May 16th, 1661. He was not the sole holder of that position. Composer Jean-Baptiste Boisset also held that title. In 1662, just before he turned 30, Lully married. His bride was Madeleine Lambert, who's the daughter of composer Michel Lambert, who was an influence and possibly a teacher of Lully in his early years in France. This wedding was attended by King Louis XIV and Queen Maria Theresa. Lee and Madeleine went on to have 10 children together. In 1664, Lully began collaborating with Molière. The two of them produced many comédie ballet pieces over the next several years, including L'Amour Médecin, Love Medicine or Medical Love in 1665, Le Sicilien in 1667, and Monsieur de Poissonniac in 1669. The duo's final collaboration was Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme in 1670. The years of 1673 to 1687 are considered Lully's most productive as a composer. He wrote an opera every year during this time, so 14 in total. During this time, his collaborator was Lebrest Philippe Quillon, and in this phase of Lully's career, he tended to focus primarily on tragic opera. There are only a few comedies sprinkled in. Working with Quinault, Lully produced, among other operas, Isis in 1677, Psyche in 1678, Le Temple de la Paix in 1685. His collaborations with other librettists were often pretty fraught. Lully was really picky. He wanted to rewrite things himself sometimes, and he was also very frank with his criticisms. These traits, combined with the fact that he had basically taken over all of music in France, led to just a lot of tension within the arts community. At one point, this turmoil actually resulted in one of his rivals trying to have Lully assassinated with arsenic, which was planned to be mixed into his tobacco. And that plot came to light when opera singer Marie Aubrey, who worked with Lully, told him about it. Her brother had been the man asked to commit the murder. There was a big trial. It went back and forth. There was an appeal. (laughs) But Lully was never actually, nobody attempted to kill him, so it was kind of a trying to prove a plot, which is tricky. 
In a moment, we'll talk about how Lily monopolized the musical life of France. But first, we will hear from our sponsors. that particularly productive time of his life, Lully also achieved an incredible coup of sorts for opera in France. He had used his various positions, power, and money to basically become the sole arbiter of what was performed on the operatic stage in the country. In addition to having achieved the highest rank possible within the monarch's power structure, he had also purchased the performing rights of librettist Pierre Perrin and composer Robert Cambert. This meant that Lully was the opera composer of France. No one could produce any operas in the country without his permission. Perrin had been granted a 12-year permit in 1669 to build opera academies anywhere in France, and Lully had been fighting that from the beginning. Initially, he insisted that the French language wasn't really a good language for longer-form opera. He thought Italian was superior He would change his opinion on that, though. We'll get to that in a moment. But just a few years after Perrin started this endeavor, he found himself in financial straits, and that was when Lully seized the moment and bought him out. Lully's offer to Perrin paid off all of his immediate debts and gave him a pension for the rest of his life. In return, Lully was able to parlay the academy rights to an exclusivity deal Uh, with the king to create the Académie Royale de Musique with no one else allowed to open an academy of that nature in France. Although Lully and Molière had been colleagues with a lot of success together, Molière tried to block this whole thing, as did other composers. By the time Lully's machinations were complete, he had managed to cut off all of his competition through one legal arrangement after another, and he profited from it as well. We'll be talking a bit more about that in a moment. He even managed to seize control over Moliere's theater within weeks of the playwright's death, and he received a royal grant to convert it into the home of the Académie Royale de Musique. When Lully started working on operas in the 1670s, Italy was considered to be the center of opera. He may well have continued to work in ballets were it not for the wavering enthusiasm of Louis XIV. When the king and Lully had met and Louis was a teenager, performing ballet was easy and enjoyable for him. But as the king got older, time gets us all, and ballet got more demanding, he didn't want to participate as much, and it stopped being his favorite of the arts. Thus, the transition to opera. Many of Lully's works borrowed from the Italian opera tradition, taking styles that had been popular earlier in his life and then giving them new life by pairing them with French verse and with the French ballet styles that had risen to prominence. He was using the balletic elements as a chorus of sorts. We said just a moment ago that Lully thought that French was not really going to work out for opera, but he challenged himself probably with some encouragement from Louis XIV, to work with the French language to make a new style of delivery that would work with opera. Some of this involved working with the way verse was spoken and sung by performers, but he also approached the problem from the opposite angle, and it was something that Lully was quite academic about. He's said to have studied the way French stage dramas were performed and then mimicked the patterns of speech musically, This way, he innovated the French opera to have a greater continuity from segment to segment. In 1681, Lully made a really interesting move. So he had, as we said, initially performed in the comedie ballet that he wrote for performances at the king's court. But over the years, his appearances on stage had waned to nothing. But that year, he returned to perform Monsieur de Poissonniac, a ballet that included sections of spoken dialogue written by Moliere. This was not a new ballet. It had first been performed 12 years earlier, but it was popular and it had gone back into rotation. In addition to writing the music for it, Lully had originated the role of a doctor in the comedy who performed in a dance segment called The Dance of the Enemas. This was pretty broad comedy, and in the 1681 performance where Lully decided to return, 
He went all out, which included surprising everyone by basically stage diving from the stage into the orchestra pit near his part's conclusion. He destroyed a harpsichord in the process, but this whole thing delighted King Louis XIV utterly, who broke out into loud laughter in the theater. One of the reasons it was so odd for Lully to engage in this kind of just clownery was that he had been working to rise even higher in the ranks of the court. He wanted to become a secretary to the king. So, as a brief explainer, the secretaries du roi were men in service to the king, who either served as advisor, notary, secretary to the king and household and crown of France and its finances, or just advisor, notary, secretary of the king, house, and crown of France. So that distinction of and its finances in that first description put those secretaries in the grand chancellery. It meant that they benefited from the country's wealth, but were also on the hook for it. This was an office that offered a chance for a common-born civil servant to really gain ranking of nobility, which could then be inherited by heirs if the secretary served for 20 years or more or if they died while in office. So this was a really ambitious move for Lully. So back to that performance of Monsieur de Porsonniac and the stage diving. The king's other secretaries did not find vamping around and jumping off the stage to be the kind of behavior suitable for someone who might gain such a position. And their feelings on the matter got to Lully's ears almost instantly, allegedly as he was leaving the stage to change out of costume. But he also received word that he was to return to the stage to give the king another bow and receive the monarch's appreciation. Lully did something rather bold. He took the opportunity to tell the king what had been going on with the other secretaries, saying, from the stage, But sire, I want to become a secretary of the king. Your secretaries will not receive me, and they may not want to receive you. The implication here was that in openly associating with Lully, the king might be tarnished. It also made very clear to the men who had just called him undignified that they were insulting the king's taste. So this was a little daggery. And the king replied with, they will no longer want to receive. It will be a great honor for them. If I'm interpreting this direct translation correctly, the implication here is that Louis XIV was essentially telling Lully and everyone else there that it would be an honor to the other secretaries for Lully to become one of their number. This feud over Lully and his rise to power continued. Lully was even confronted over the issue by the French Minister of War, François-Michel Le Tellier, Marquis de Louvois. Louvois had been approached by the other secretaries to intercede on their behalf, and he explained to Lully that it really was not appropriate for him, a performer and comedian, to try to rise to such a station, making a note that Lully's only real skill was making Louis XIV laugh. So that was sort of comparing him to being nothing more than a jester. I feel like jesters can be really powerful, but that was not... The, <laughs> it's not the implication here. Lully replied rather indignantly that Louvois would do the exact same thing if he could, implying that the minister had no sense of humor. Things escalated to the point where King Louis XIV made clear to the secretaries through an intermediary that they were the ones who were behaving badly and that they should see Lully's desire to become a secretary as an honor. At some point, though it's not entirely clear when, the king had already given Lully the required lettre de noblesse that made him part of the French nobility and should have given him enough credentials that he could pursue the office of secretary without issue, although the letters would not have been a requirement for it. Finally, in December 1681, Lully purchased the title of Esquire Advisor Secretary to the King Household Crown of France and His Finances. He purchased that office from the widow of the prior holder, Joseph Clausel, as would have been customary at the time. Basically, he was buying out their family's inheritance. Madame Clausel received 63,000 livres in exchange for Lully's assumption of the position. Having been admonished by the throne, the other secretaries accepted Lully, at least on the surface, and for his part, Lully invited many of them to a feast and an evening of opera to celebrate. 
The role of secretary was clearly important to Lully. All of his scores after this had printed at the top by Monsieur Lully, Esquire, Advisor, Secretary to the King House, Crown of France and its Finances, and Superintendent of His Majesty's Music, just in case you wanted a really long title and business card. Every time. Uh, In just a moment, we will talk about how lucrative becoming a King's Secretary was for the composer and where the rest of his wealth came from. First, though, we will hear from the sponsors that keep Stuff You Missed in History class going. James P. Fairley, writing for the periodical Bach in 1984, noted that Lully was, through his position as secretary, collecting an estimated 1,600 livres a year, in addition to the money he was being paid for his various other offices. His positions as the master of music to the royal family and the composer to the king would have gotten him an estimated 30,000 livres a year. Additionally, in instances where anyone wished to perform in the country using more than two singers and more than six violins, it was now considered an opera and Lully was to be paid a fee in exchange for permission to perform. And this control over who could perform and where in the country really became a rather ruthless pursuit for Lully and one that he approached strategically. In 1684, Louis XIV granted him the power to approve or deny requests for building opera houses anywhere in the country, and his approval came with a fee, of course. When Lully's daughter, Catherine Madeleine, married one of the king's household staff, Nicholas Francine, in 1684, the composer let his new son-in-law manage some of the non-creative day-to-day elements of the Académie Royale de Musique, This offered him some breathing room in what was a really packed schedule because Lully was not just writing operas, he was also staging them, running rehearsals, training new talent, and by all accounts was kind of a backbreaker in all of it. He was incredibly exacting in his staging and arrangement. There were accounts of him having a violent temper when his performers weren't working as hard as he wanted them to. Audiences, though, saw none of this. They just saw excellence. Almost equivalent to Lully's excellence in his work and his ambition was his astute accumulation of real estate to ensure that his wealth continued to grow. He purchased multiple properties as he got more and more money, and in 1682, he moved his family to a huge house outside of Paris that was surrounded by gardens. He even attempted to purchase the entire county of Grignon near the Swiss border. And this particular effort caused friction with other nobles for a couple of reasons. One, someone else had already bid on it when Lully swooped in and offered 50% more than the existing bid, which by most estimations was more than it was worth, so it kind of just seemed like he wanted to be a jerk. There was really like this air of dishonor about the whole thing. Like you wouldn't do that to a, a colleague or an equal. But it also really riled the aristocracy in general, who just thought Lully was being really showy with his cash. That was, to them, extra gauche because he wasn't even French to begin with. One letter that passed between two members of the nobility read, quote, Must a wanderer have the temerity to have such land? The wealth of a man of this quality is greater than that of the prime ministers and the other princes of Europe. Lily did not get Grignon, but he sure did keep on buying properties in Paris. There was more drama in the composer's life in 1685 when Lully's page named Brunet was removed from the composer's household. Lily's romance with Brunet has been described by some historians as kind of an open secret. In the journal Historical Reflections in 2007, Philip Brett wrote an article titled Issues in Music and Sexuality in the Long 18th Century. And in this article, Brett mentions that Lully was part of a circle of men within the court of Louis XIV who were known to have affairs with other men. And this was something that was mentioned in the writing of the day. One account of Lully's contemporaries mentions that the king was growing tired of Lully's conduct with other men, particularly because he was becoming less and less covert about such things. And in the case of Brunet, it appears that things had become really too obvious. They had to be ended by external forces. 
This was also happening as Louis XIV was becoming more devout himself following Queen Maria Therese's death and his marriage in secret to Françoise d'Aubigne, Madame de Maintenon. The 1680s was also when Lully composed most of his religious music. This was partially a response to the clergy's critiques of Lully's operas, as well as shifting attitudes at court. So he had gone from ballets to operas because the king wanted it, and now he was kind of getting into sacred music because that was what the king was into then. It was also probably helping to revise Lully's public persona. The king had kind of turned on opera, and Lully did not enjoy royal favor the way he once had, although he did retain his various titles. I read one account that said he kept making Louis XIV angry because of his affairs and his behavior, but he always forgave him in the end. In November of 1686, Louis XIV underwent surgery for an anal fistula. The surgery was painful, and the recovery process was long. Finally, in early 1687, the king was feeling well, and Lully planned a celebratory performance of his piece Te Deum. During the concert, which took place on January 8th, he conducted an orchestra of more than 150 musicians in the Couvent de Fouillon, the royal monastery of St. Bernard, for that occasion. As part of his renowned perfectionism, Lully was known to beat time with a sharpened cane that also served as his conductor's baton. But during this event, he accidentally brought the sharp end of this cane down on his own foot instead of the stage while marking time, and he pierced through the shoe into his toe. Over the next weeks, that toe became infected and gangrene set in. Lully's physicians wanted to amputate, but he refused. There are accounts that indicate that he said that he would no longer be able to dance if he submitted to an amputation, but surely he was aware that even if he didn't have an amputation and his foot healed, his dancing days were probably over. But he became sicker and sicker, and he must have known that he had basically doomed himself because he made various end-of-life legal arrangements. Jean-Baptiste Lully died on March 22nd of 1687. He was buried in the Church of Notre-Dame-des-Victoires. To be clear, that is not the same as Notre-Dame Cathedral. When Lully died, he left behind an impressive fortune for his heirs. His holdings were estimated to be worth about 800,000 livres, although in some accounts it's closer to a million. He had five homes in Paris— the very large and opulently decorated home he lived in during his last years in the suburb of ville Two country houses, one at Puteaux and one at Sevres. He also had two blocks of apartments in the Rue Royale and Rue de Petit Champ. As a landlord, he had a steady stream of income from those properties alone. Yeah, his he did what he, he set out to do, which was to set up, you know, a name for himself create family wealth, make his family noble. His children inherited all of that. Uh, So he kind of, you know, he set a goal and he achieved it. Uh, Today, Lully is often credited with founding the French opera, although we should note there were certainly other composers contributing to the field at the same time, even though Lully did try to have them silenced with his legal maneuvering. The range of feelings about him, bookended by his own time in the modern world, can perhaps be summed up best in two quotes. The first is from James P. Fairley, who we mentioned earlier. In his 1984 writing, he said of Lully, quote, He was one of the few men of genius belonging to the company of royal secretaries. Despite his many shortcomings, he was among the brightest lights in the reign of Louis XIV. And then the next is a comment from one of Lully's contemporaries, the librettist Jean de La Fontaine, who once stated in the papers of the day about Lully, quote, he is lewd and evil-minded and he devours all. So the good news is, if people think you're a monster today, eventually you might be lauded as amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Do you have some listener mail for us? I do, and unsurprisingly to me, we got emails about hot Dr. Pepper. Uh, yeah, we did. We did. <laughs> uh, the one I'm reading today is from our listener, Laura, who writes, Hi, Tracy and Holly. I've been waiting for an excuse to write you two for a long time, and I know I don't need an excuse to tell you how wonderful y'all are. And this week gave me two. I grew up in a very teetotaler household where my father was very anti-alcohol, 
in any form. He has loosened up as he's aged. And one of our Christmas winter holiday drinks was mulled Dr. Pepper. My stepmom would heat it on the stove with spices like you do a mulled wine, and we would have that on special winter occasions. Maybe it does not sound good to you, but I have fond memories of hot mulled Dr. P and Christmas or New Year's celebrations. As for hot Dr. Pepper from a bottle heated in a car, I agree that is gross. Hot (laughs) plastic does not impart good flavor. Second thing I wanted to write to you about is Anne Hutchinson, which is from the episode Tracy Research that week. Mm -hmm. I've been meaning to write to ask for an episode about her. Time always gets away from me. and was very excited that she is a big part of the Mary Dyer episode. I lived for 12 years in the Bronx, New York, right next to the Hutchinson River Parkway, which everyone calls the Hutch, which is named for Anne Hutchinson. I find her to be very interesting and loved learning about her and Mary Dyer from you two. I love Stuff You Missed in History Class and have listened to all the back episodes. I think I started listening in 2009 or 2010. I also listened to all of Pop Stuff back when that was on. Thank you for all you've taught me, and I'm always excited to listen to a new episode. I love you two and the previous host, too. Much love, Laura. What a sweet, sweet email. Mm-hmm. Um, hot Dr. P, listen. So, I do like a mulled wine or a mulled cider. Those can be great. No, they're not for you. I don't, um... <sighs> I really struggle. Mm-hmm. I really struggle with hot punches. Sure. I mean, I drink hot coffee with sweetener, so it's not a hot sweet issue. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. Um, It might be a level of sweetness, like a Mm -hmm. hot fruity drinks of any kind. No. Mm -hmm. But I'm willing to try it. Look, I've never... Now I'm like, well, maybe maybe we'll try a Dr. Pepper situation. I would be willing to try kind of a, like, hot mulled Dr. Pepper. I would try that. Too, I would probably put alcohol in it. <laughs> <laughs> I, my, the way my brain auto filled that sentence was I would probably put it over ice with some vodka. That was, <laughs> oh. I was like, that would defeat the purpose no, of it no, being. No, I'll do it, I'll do it warm with vodka. That's fine. That's fine. Um, <laughs> Uh, we have some other Dr. Pepper emails we might read because there's some interesting ones and I appreciate it. And I, listen, I want everyone to stand up for the things they love. Even if I'm like, oh, yuck, because that's one ding dong's opinion. I also think that sometimes people get very, uh, they will take personally other people's like food and beverage preference. And I'm like, it's okay. It is okay if you personally don't like a particular flavor or texture or whatever. That is not, that's not a judgment on anybody else's use of that flavor or texture unless you are literally like people who like this are bad and (laughs) nobody's saying that. This is indicative of moral failing. (laughs) (laughs) No, everybody uh, eat and drink what you like so long as it is, you know, uh, safe and not going to hurt anybody. Yeah, like I, I know there's a whole... Like, people can make value judgments about, like, foods and beverages and things that are, like, racist or classist or whatever. I'm just talking about if you don't like the way something tastes in your mouth, nobody needs to be offended about that. Listen, I eat lots of stuff that I'm sure other people find horrifying. Fine. No big. Uh, If you would like to write to us about your hot Dr. Pepper desires or memories. You can do that at history podcast at iHeartRadio.com. You can also find us on social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.